we're at a moment of splitting. And I would say that it's not actually going to be a trajectory where we keep on muddling through down the middle. It's either going to go very badly and get increasingly hard to improve the situation, or else if we make improvements, the potential of science and society for good is such that it could get quite good. It's not right to average the differences and say there's going to be a little bit of both because they're both overdetermining factors that are going to shove us more in one direction or another. Welcome, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining our webinar today. Uh, my name is Stanley Wu, and I'm the coordinator of Omega and director of the Resilience Project. Omega is a resilience funders network, a collaboration working on the global poly crisis. And we are delighted to be joined by Kim Stanley Robinson today, who has published 19 no novels and numerous short stories. Stan is best known for the Mars trilogy and for Ministry for the Future. His work has been translated into 24 language and is one of Barack Obama's favorite books of the year, that is Ministry for the Future. This webinar will be hosted by Michael Lerner, and I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. The webinar is co-sponsored by the Millennium Alliance for Humanity in the Biosphere, Kranz Foresight Analysis Nexus, the New School at Commonweal, and the Resilience Project. Now, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Michael Lerner. Thank you, Stanley Wu, and Kim Stanley Robinson, welcome to the Omega webinar. We're so honored to have you. Thanks, Michael. It's good to be with you. So I understand you're at a B&B &B in Oakland uh, on in a little uh, gazebo in the back, a little yeah. concerned with noise from the freeway, but uh, we haven't heard it yet. And if you need to move, you'll let us know. Um, in our circles, Stan, um, the Ministry for the Future has become what is known as an ur text, a basic dimension of polycrisis literacy. Uh, and so uh, it, it really is something, uh, there's kind of before you've read Ministry for the Future and after you've read it. And uh, so I think many of us have just found it an extraordinarily useful book. So uh, we agreed that the way you like to do these conversations is to start with a 10 minute introduction of yourself and the book. So uh, we'd love to have you start with that and then I'll begin with some questions and I'll pick up questions uh, from the chat. Great, thanks Michael. Um, yes, well, I'm an American science fiction writer and an American leftist. Um, and there is a powerful political strand in all science fiction because it my definition of it is any story set in the future is a science fiction story. It's a simple definition and it works pretty well. So when you set a story in the future, you are revealing your theories of history, your political orientation. It, it can be subtle. It can be uh, outside the writer's uh, awareness of their construction of the story, um, but it's always there. And since it is, it's best, I think, to be aware of it and to put it to use because the setting a story in the future is a, a peculiar gesture to make, especially if you're interested in realism, which I am as a novelist. And really the novel as an art form is, is considered to be almost a definer of realism uh, in the sense that it creates our sense of what social reality is. It's the story we tell ourselves. So to set one of those in the future is, a, as I say, counterintuitive uh, for someone interested in realism and yet I've done it all my life out of a sense that it's almost like shooting skeet uh, that to hit the target of the present you need to aim your project a little bit ahead and and um, include the trajectories as an interesting thing and it certainly makes for new stories and new stories are hard to find so as Michael said, I'm uh, Stanley said, I'm best known for the, my Mars trilogy, which comes from the early 90s. And in the description of terraforming Mars and turning it into a human place, I had to think about everything. And the novel covered about 200 years, a very peculiar assignment. Um, novels typically cover a lifetime at most, but often just a few months in, in people's lives. Um, so I guess, uh, practice and study of literature, uh, um, the canon, the tradition as a craft, the novel 
has uh, gotten me to the point where I consider myself to be a utopian science fiction writer. That's been true since the Mars Trilogy. And I would make a very simple cut there too. If you have a positive future, that's utopian science fiction. If you have a negative future, that's dystopian. And so they, they model and reflect our hopes and our dreams, respectively. So I have deliberately, as a political project and an aesthetic project, taken on this weird, uncomfortable, awkward form, the utopian novel. And that is to mix two very different things. Utopias are blueprints for better futures, going back to Sir Thomas More. Novels tend to be about people's problems. The plot is made out of problems and things going wrong. So somewhat like um, they can be structurally, they're similar to soap operas. So you, if you have architectural blueprints mixed with soap operas, you see my aesthetic problem. It doesn't look like they're a match. Um, but Ursula K. Le Guin showed in The Dispossessed that it can work. And I've been following in her footsteps on that front, trying it over and over again. So that brings me to Ministry for the Future. Climate change is, uh, is, is already happening and has become the overriding determinant of what we're gonna be doing in the next few decades. So you do new uh, near future science fiction and you really need to take on climate change. And if you're doing utopian science fiction, it sits there as a problem to be solved as it does for society at large. And that being the case, uh, I would say that Ministry for the Future shows that you could say it this way, utopian science fiction has lowered, has lowered its bar to be defined as such. If we can get through this uh, century without a mass extinction event and, and into a better balance with the biosphere, that's a utopian future. That's, uh, that's gonna be hard to accomplish from where we are right now, as everybody knows. And I, I appreciate this description of the, of the crisis as a polycrisis that Michael uses and the Omega in general, because it is a polycrisis. Uh, the, the climate change problem is the one that you can see and focus on, but there are so many other biospheric problems. Um, and I, we all know what they are and they are combining in a, into a, what is called technically a wicked problem in that uh, you can't just solve one because others are impinging on that one. So it's a, a network problem. So, well, how do you write a novel about that? It's um, awkward and, and even intimidating, but, it, but at this point, I think the, I'm confident the novel can do anything. And I've certainly stretched it to its limits in various directions, tried formal experiments of all kinds out of the modernist tradition. In this case, I decided to make it a grab bag, uh, a, a polyvocal. It's a polycrisis, so you have a polyvocal narrative that is a heteroglossia. Some of this comes out of uh, Mikhail Bakhtin, his theory that novels are always more than one voice. And I very much agree with that. So I threw in lots of voices and lots of styles, lots of forms of, um, you know, of radio transcripts, um, memo notes, um, prose poems, riddles, uh, mini essays, uh, fictional Wikipedia articles, it, this kind of thing, all thrown in the mix. But the main component was the eyewitness account, because the eyewitness account is a, is a genre of, of narrative under theorized as, as such. People don't seem to have noticed that the eyewitness accounts do not work like novels work, like fiction works. People are telling you what they saw. They do not set the table. They don't describe what they had for breakfast on the morning of the, the thing that they saw. They cut to the chase. It's a really powerful um, uh, genre. And I, I decided to put it to use and Ministry for the Future has, I don't know, 30 or 40 fictionalized eyewitness accounts from the various things that happen in these next 30 years or so. And then the last thing I'll say before we go to questions is um, it was the news of the wet bulb 35 temperatures being fatal to humans that, that sort of uh, uh, leaked out of the scientific literature, you might say, about 2018 that um, was, uh, was like sticking my finger into a, a wall socket. Uh, it was electrifying news because what it does is it knocks on the head all, these all this talk of adaptation. You have a certain strand of economics and humanitarian uh, humanities people and um, sanguine people. Humanity, you know, humans are so adaptable. We'll just adapt to whatever happens. We don't have to worry so much about this heat level rise. If it goes to three, you know, you're talking about 1.5. Why do you say that? We could adapt to three. No, turns out not to be true because there's physical limits to how much heat and humidity the human body can handle in combination. When I read that, that's the finger in the socket. I got to write this book. I got to describe 
that we actually have to get on the case now that the 1.5 limit is a real limit and we can't adapt to anything like these people were saying, which was silly to begin with, but now prove false. So that was my stimulus. And I, um, I wrote the book in 2019, which I think is useful to remember because that's a previous geological era at this point. It was, um, it was pre-Biden and it was pre-COVID when I wrote the book. So I was in a much darker place when I wrote that book. Uh, in many ways, I'm more hopeful now I, than I was when I wrote the book. And I've learned some things that uh, support that idea, which we can talk about later. Um, yeah, so there you have it. That's, let's move over to uh, Michael and let's, let's have a dialogue here and a conversation about it. Great, Stan. So let's just start right there. You've learned some things since 2019. Uh, what have you learned? Um, I, well, I, I can list them and we can talk about them in, in more detail later. I thought that the carbon coin was the obscure idea of a guy named Delton Chen and um, that introducing it to the world was news. Uh, in, and that the central banks were gonna have to be flogged into taking action to uh, make money more responsive to green concerns. In fact, the central banks, this is Mark Carney, Bank of England, 2015, suggested the central banks needed to organize. And now there's a called a network for greening the financial system, which is 89 central banks, maybe more now, talking about what can they do with monetary policy to green the financial system. I didn't know that. I, I thought I was making it up from more obscure sources. Um, it also turns out that this, this plan to um, pump water out from underneath the big glaciers of Antarctica and Greenland to slow them back down to the speeds they had before and, and prevent massive sea level rise, or at least ma uh, much reduce it. Um, well, there's papers on it in Nature Magazine. It wasn't just a single glaciologist acquaintance's idea. It, w it has been studied and, and um, number, uh, quantitative studies. So numbers have been put to it. It looks like it could work. And then um, lastly, this rubric, and this is especially given the group that I'm talking to, um, the highest rate of return. Well, that's an index. And if we believe the current um, gauges of the highest rate of return, because capital always goes to the highest rate of return, it's an algorithm in any case that drives where money goes, hedge fund managers, et cetera. Um, we're doomed if we take the old measures of what the highest rate of return is, uh, the profit shareholder value. But, but the, the thing I'm concentrating on is the rubric by which these things are calculated. If you include some green metrics that uh, include futurity, include the uh, impacts on the environment into the creation formation of that index, then the highest rate of return shifts itself by definition to different investments that would be better for the biosphere. So, okay, the creation of that rubric, um, people talk about it in my book, it's already happening. There's a sincere effort to uh, create new rubrics to calculate the uh, social value of, uh, uh, and not just profit of what enterprises do. So these are all new. I mean, what, what, I, what I would add to, together to say is that, uh, uh, Ministry for the Future, in attempting to be ahead of the curve, miscalculated how fast things are changing. And I was just barely even able to model the present. And uh, the timeline in my novel is completely wrong. Things I talked about happening in the 2030s are happening already. And this is one of the reasons why I feel uh, hopeful. Uh, Stan, I think it'd be useful to give people just a, a really brief uh sense of the of the plot of the novel many have read it i can i can do it but it would actually be better if you gave us just a really brief overview of it sure the novel starts with a a, a wet bulb 35 heat wave in india killing millions and the indian government therefore becoming radicalized essentially the the government in charge falling and being replaced by a much more activist radical indian government um, and then it, it shifts over to zurich Switzerland, where I postulate that the Paris Agreement, uh, Congress of the Parties, as part of the Paris Agreement, they are uh, have given themselves the ability to set up standing committees. So I, I postulated they set up a standing committee that got nicknamed the Ministry for the Future. It's set in Zurich um, rather than Geneva uh, for personal reasons, because I've lived in Zurich. 
And there that ministry begins to go to work trying to defend the rights, legal and social of the future generations and of the living creatures that can't speak for themselves, animals and also young children, etc. So this ministry for the future begins to go at the problem, the poly, the poly crisis. Uh, but, but it's a, just one small international organization. You all know them like a, not quite an NGO, like a UN. It's a, effectively, it is part of the UN because the Paris Agreement was organized in the UN. Well, how effective have they been over the years? You could say quite a bit. Uh, you could also say not that much. It depends which way you look at it. But my ministry charged with this heavy charge begins to feel like um, they are, uh, they need to do more. And what does that mean? What does that entail? Doing more to try to stimulate the world to get into a better place. So um, my main character is a, a Irish woman who is the head of the ministry and she's a, a Euro, Euro bureaucrat, a technocrat, and then several other characters and then many eyewitness accounts. So that's how the novel is structured. And it goes forward about 30 years. And it, I would say it's a best case scenario that you can still believe in. So a lot of bad stuff happens in that novel. And it, and it obvious reading it afterwards, because I when I write it, it's a lot of unconscious decisions are being made. But reading it afterwards, it's very clear that I was making sure that anytime something good happened, something bad happened immediately to bring you back to your senses that this is going to, as a wicked problem, this isn't going to be an easy one to solve. There's no single fix, et cetera. So what has surprised you most about the reception? Well, the reception itself has been uh, surprising. Um, my previous novel, which is about China, um, uh, more or less uh, disappeared without notice. That I've had a kind of roller coaster career. Uh, by no means is it obvious how a book of mine will do when it's published. It can range from anything to uh, quite a celebration. Uh, and this is all at a level of what used to be called the mid list, um, a kind of a mini bestseller, but more a long seller uh, to uh, complete complete obscurity. So when this was book was published, it, it looked like all the rest of the books at first. It was about a year ago. And as the fall proceeded uh, at, and people read it, attention blossomed. And the book, it's not that it struck a nerve. Maybe that, that's not the right way to put it. It filled a need. People had a hunger for a story of this kind. So that the, the weirdnesses of Ministry for the Future as a novel are irrelevant compared to the need for this kind of a story of a best case scenario that we could actually make get through this uh, century without a mass extinction event is a story that uh, people want that needs to be told. And yet there aren't many stories like that out there. Hmm. So um, that's been the big surprise. And um, for a while it was scary because I'm just a novelist and the novel Ministry for the Future is my best foot forward. It's what I have to say about this matter. And it it does a better job than I do in explaining um, almost everything. So um, I began to get scared, like, what can I say beyond it? But I've found that um, everybody's in the same boat in terms of talking about the poly crisis. We all know everything. We, none of us are expert enough to be completely on top of every aspect of it. We uh, filter the information that comes into us through our ideological lenses, and then we try to formulate a coherent picture of what's going on and where we should put our efforts. Um, the fact that I am not an expert on any of these issues doesn't matter so much as just that I'm an informed citizen that writes novels, and I, I write novels set in the future so I can talk about what that process entails. So I've gotten over that part of the surprise too. Um, and also you can turn it around. You can begin to ask questions. And also, for instance, in this, in this case, uh, talking to this crowd, I'm thinking, well, what, what can investment do? What, what can the private sector do to um, um, uh, aid the effort to deal with the crisis? And, and so in each one of the situations I've found myself in, I've been thinking about, well, what, do, what, what does this group, uh, what's their interests? What would be interesting to hear about? And it's been, I mean, it's been all over the map. I've talked to study groups from um, various US uh, uh, federal institutions. I've talked to people from the army, people from the Fed, et cetera. These are study groups. They're not making policy, but they are studying the situation. 
And it, it's surprising what can be stimulated beyond my book when I start to think about, um, well, what should the army do, for instance, that kind of thing. So these have been the big surprises. I'm very pleased, um, I, as I say, since the book could have disappeared without a trace, the attention that it's getting, I think is, um, it's pleasing to me personally, but it's also important. It's an indication that people are really um, concerned about this problem and they want to think about it. And this book is an aid to thinking about it. So since you're talking to this crowd and, and have talked to the other crowds that you've described, uh, the study groups and so forth, it would be immensely valuable to us uh, if you could chart out any, any of the map of strategic opportunities that you've seen in different sectors where people are thinking seriously about this. I mean, you talked about the Fed, you talked about the military. If you were to make a list of where strategic thinking is going on that has legs uh, for a community of funders who are seeking to develop an Omega Resilience Funders Network to move the independent sector to really address the poly crisis in the hope that moving the independent sector will enable us to help move government, the media, the corporate world, and so forth. That's the theory of social change. So it would be immensely useful to us, not only to chart the places in the independent sector and philanthropy and the NGOs, but to point to the other places where you see movement possible and where you, in other words, I would hope that you might consider writing an article or an essay um, saying what you've learned from the reception to the book, you know, describing, uh, uh, what I'm asking you now to, to sketch out for us. What, what have you seen that looks promising to you where people are thinking seriously about this? Well, one, one thing that I've seen is uh, uh, I've been invited to join a working group at the UN that is trying to scope out 50 years in the future rather than their usual five-year um, scoping sessions. And what they, part of what they've done, it's an interesting project and I'm helping them as much as I can with the, and there I can help in the craft sense of, of um, building future scenarios and, and sort of mentally testing them for their believability, looking for hidden crevasses in the narrative that make mean that it, it can't happen, that kind of thing. But they've begun to rate uh, this organization has begun to rate the various possibilities for um, uh, the technologies, the social systems that are uh, shovel ready, that are that uh, that should and that uh, could do a lot of good and should be prioritized. So they're trying to make prioritized lists because there's so many good projects. So how do you decide which one deserves uh, instant support? They're trying to make an analytic uh, rubric that would allow them to. Uh, prioritize and rate the many, many ideas that come pouring in. Now that's an effort that I believe anybody can apply themselves to. And indeed the, uh, the UN strikes me as a, um, new to the game uh, in, this, in, in some senses that uh, this particular group, um, the, the idea of um, the techniques of this kind of future uh, uh, rating of the possibilities of the future, there might be people who are already used to it and doing it, even in this crowd. Uh, and then the other thing that I've learned that it, it seems obvious to me, but it needs to be repeated, especially in the private sector, is the people who get first to these opportunities will be the ones that will benefit the most over the long haul as businesses by the necessity of the transition to a clean uh, energy base, a clean economy in general, uh, uh, a, a, an infrastructure and a technological base that is actually in balance with the biosphere is a technological achievement that is going to require new technologies and new social systems and a new political economy, I would say. But in any case, going back to the, uh, the first, if uh, in rating investment possibilities in the present, um, some are going to look better than others, but um, there will be ones that have 
a future payoff so high that getting there first might be, um, even if it isn't the highest rate of return right now, it's clear that getting there first will mean that you're in a great position going forward to uh, rapidly develop things that are important to us. So these are thoughts that occur to me. Um, the, the analytical tools, like again, can you make a rubric that creates a, a, a new highest rate of return, a new um, stimulus to invest or guide to investment by way of what's the return going to be on this that includes social and uh, environmental factors? That's, I think, key and also something anybody can apply themselves to. Mm -hmm. uh, for your UN group, um... I don't know if you may well not have heard of the VK Rasmussen Foundation out of Sweden and New York, uh, which uh, is the first significant foundation that I'm aware of that has taken the climate issue, uh, situated it directly in the poly crisis, and is focused on 2040, uh, not so interested in the 2020s and 2030s, but what will the world look like in 2040? And uh, Irene Karup, the executive director, has done an astonishing job of scoping that field. So it seems to me that it would be extraordinarily useful if it hasn't happened already to get your colleagues in the UN uh, connected with uh, VK Rasmussen Foundation. We can- Good, yeah, we, you'll, you'll have to send me that information. I will do that, I will do that. Uh, One so, thing I wanna say, um, about um, this, these efforts, what's this life going to be like in 2040? I've done that myself. Uh, it's really what I do. Um, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, and because de it depends, it's sensitive dependence on initial conditions. What we do now will generate either a range of futures ranging from really bad, um, catastrophically bad, to really quite good and promising and filled with potential for even further good. In that range, you, when you're asked to, you can only talk about that range of possibilities and what might lead to one or the other. You cannot say, you cannot uh, find a trajectory. We're, we're at a peculiar moment where if you think to physics, like we're on a trajectory, well, no, we've hit a, a, a turbulence such that um, it can, we're at a moment of splitting. The 2020s are going to uh, scatter off into, a, and I would say that it's not actually going to be a trajectory where we keep on muddling through down the middle. It's either going to uh, go very badly and get increasingly hard to improve the situation, or else if we make improvements, it's going to, the potential of science and society for good is such that it could get quite good. It's not right to average the differences and say there's going to be a little bit of both because they're both over determining factors that are going to shove us more in one direction or another. Mm -hmm. uh, we're getting a lot of wonderful questions in the chat. I won't be able to get to all of them, but Howard Frumpkin, uh, who is doing extraordinary work with uh, the lens of planetary health. And I, I find the health lens to be a particularly useful one and one that's central to ministry for the future. When we started the Health and Environmental Funders Network 22 years ago, the situation of philanthropy then was there were grant makers in health and there were grant makers in the environment, but nobody was focused at the intersection of health and the environment, which is where people care about stuff because it's when the environment affects their health. So uh, Howie writes, um, I was struck and gratified by your integration of social justice into the solution. Do you see this as intrinsic to civilizational survival in the face of climate change or as a separate and parallel but non-essential good? That's a good question. Um, it leads to pondering scenarios in which um, a kind of a brutal calculus of survivalism is applied and you get to certain, sometimes they call it eco-fascism, which really is just an attack on the environmental movement. There's no such thing, but you could imagine a kind of police state that enforced um, uh, compliance with um, lower burn activities and then the devil take the hindmost where the poor aren't brought along. But since they're at the sharp end of the stick anyway already, I would say that the two are integrated and are, um, uh, crucial parts of a, the same problem. Uh, without social justice, 
what does that even mean? You have to, uh, you would be doing something cynical, so cynical that it would undercut any claims to moral worth for the environmental effort. So, okay, we've got 8 billion people on this planet, let's just rough it upwards. And about 2 billion of them are immiserated in ways that are solvable. And the, the UN developmental goals and the rising out of poverty that uh, met certain rubrics and really did a lot of good work shows that that could be done if that was a priority for global civilization. But the global capitalist economy doesn't care because it's an algorithm, a simple-minded algorithm, go to the highest rate of return as calculated by current ratings of profit, which discount the future, which discount um, people's needs, et cetera. It's extractive, it's accumulative. It's the classic um, negative definition of capitalism and neoliberal capitalism since 1980 has enough um, bad actions on its plate to say that we need at the very least a return to Keynesianism, uh, a return to government control of the private economy to guide it into certain activities by way of regulation, direct legislation, um, creation of new money going that direction. We can talk about all this later. But um, social justice, to get back to it, is an integral part of the project. And even if it was just a matter of enlightened self-interest for the developed world, for the rich world, to look at the poor world and say, well, you know, that's their problem. But we created that problem for them. And they are simply fellow citizens who have, uh, are at the short end of the stick of the post-colonial situation. Um, imperialism, capitalist extraction, colonialism, the, we're still living in the blast zone of the aftermath of that. And until we get it to the point where everybody on the planet's at adequacy and feeling like they have dignity and adequacy, then we've got nothing. That, that's the bedrock first principle. It's, when you call it a polycrisis, this is good partly because you bring in the human element, the need to pe um, um, create a situation of adequacy and dignity for everybody on the planet. And even if it was enlightened self-interest, you could say, well, if we don't create that situation, there's going to be 2 billion pe people out for your blood and um, they can get to you and you're, anything good you create can be destabilized by an extremely angry, um, uh, disadvantaged or, or exploited mm. class. You are a, uh, at least according to Wikipedia, a dues paying member of the Democratic Socialists of America. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, um, and, and you described yourself as, as uh, you know, as a leftist and um, this is very congruent with that. Um, uh, the, um, and yet, um, in order to make the changes we need to make, um, is it not true that we're going to need buy-in and engagement from people across the political and economic spectrum? In other words, is this a problem that can be solved by progressives, by the force of uh, virtue and vision, or is it something uh, where we're really going to need, as in Ministry for the Future, uh, where the, the central bankers finally get convinced to create the carbon coin? Uh, aren't we going to need people for, from across the spectrum? And if so, how does that work from a social justice perspective? <clears throat> Well, this is a hard question. It pulls in a lot of things. Um, we are in a global capitalist system and, and it's the law. And we have an environmental crisis that needs to be dealt with immediately, having been put off for too long. So you got to look at the system that already exists. Um, and I would say from a leftist perspective and say, where is the public good in the current system, where is public power? So I would say, I mean, going to small examples, the Democratic Socialists of America is a rather tiny organization and I, I'm happy that they exist and glad to support them, but they are um, an interest group that can serve to pull the American Democratic Party further to left. It's our only used value politically is to speak for a certain vision of the Democratic Party. 
Then you get into the larger question of party politics, which in America, there's the two party system. And you definitely need the Democratic Party to be as progressive as possible if we're going to cope with this problem. If, if uh, I mean, there's uh, been characterizations of the two party system in America as being, you know, capitalism A and capitalism B, with a little bit of social democracy tossed into B, um, that might not be enough. We need to go further left, and the public good needs to be an overriding consideration. Mm -hmm. So um, this somewhat resembles <clears throat> the situation in the 30s or the 1940s, where the the crisis is so dire that the government has to step in and do a kind of Keynesian thing and say, we are uh, seizing finance, we are seizing the American business machinery to prosecute a particular project. In that case, it was winning a war against another um, uh, alliance. In this case, everybody's on the same side, but the, the crisis is perhaps even more existential. We're destroying our, our infrastructure base, our biosphere. So you're going to have to get working political majorities. It's going to have to be a realist project. Um, you can postulate utopian solutions that would maybe work if they were instituted immediately, but that's not the world we live in. So what you need is to, uh, is to um, think up things that can be done now. And that's what drove me to the central banks. That if you think of government as being a business that is owned by the people, so that government is of the people, by the people, for the people, and it actually owns the money that everybody trusts and trades in. So that money is a, a medium of exchange, a store of value and a sign of social trust. And massive inflation or deflation is a sign that social trust has been lost. And you need to trust money, which is to say trusting other people. So central banks have got that charge. We need to make sure that money stays trustworthy. But essentially it's a public Um, money itself and ultimately owned by the public so that governments themselves can begin to shove money around. Quantitative easing, carbon quantitative easing, the invention of the carbon coin, they all follow from that. And what I like about them is they are insisting on the underlying uh, commons, on the underlying ownership of everything by the public, by all people, including the ones that are now disadvantaged. Government needs to represent them too and support them too. And that that insistence on the ultimate source of value, which is to say the public sphere and everybody gets instrumentalized into policy so that you can't have private exploitation and important. Uh, Stan, we're getting a little, um, you're, you're freezing up a good deal. I wonder if, if you move inside, will you be closer to the Wi-Fi? I would assume so. And so, yeah, all right. I'm, I'm going to make that journey. Good. Um, let's see. I hope this helps. This is pretty close to the. I, I, I bet it will. Uh, so just a couple of uh, questions that and, and thoughts. I uh, share Miller of the Post Carbon Institute, which is really one of the leading organizations in the US and globally working on, on uh, resilience uh, reminds us, speaking of social equity, that the pandemic and the risk of variants proliferating shows that self-interest and global justice are one and the same ultimately. So that's a, a nice thought. Yeah. Uh, Mark Valentine, who has done a lot of thinking about these issues and also very interested in sci-fi and speculative uh, fiction, uh, ask this, as you noted in your introduction, the novel is a grab bag of ideas, some of which are proven models, such as the Mondragon Co-op, and others conceptual, such as Carbon Coin. To that end, it felt like you were reflecting back to the reader what we, that we know enough to make changes necessary to avert collapse. Then he asks, I'm curious if there were any ideas that you wish you'd inserted into the Ministry for the Future that could inform our investment of both time and money going forward. And I will add two more, and then you can just riff off all of these. Shuri Myers wrote, art is necessary, a necessity, because you cannot build the future without first imagining it. Who else would you point to in the speculative future community who is doing great work? How can we support their work other than eagerly awaiting their publications? And the final one I will note, is a, uh, a question well back 
but it was whether it's a question I asked you too early on, and it's a critical question on, that you've addressed, is the question of whether the violence in the book, here it is, uh, from uh, James McGreen, uh, do you see the violence in the book as necessary to advance the novel story, but avoidable in real life? And to me, that seems like one of the most critical questions at all, because it really is the dark wing of the Ministry for the Future that plays an absolutely central role in getting to a, be a better future. And in the book club where I listened to you, uh, you, were, you were not agonizing, but reflecting on what a difficult choice it was uh, to, create, uh, to create that part of the story. So those are a series of thoughts and you can respond in any way you choose. Sure. Um, one thing I wanna to say to, at the start is that um, I have developed a habit that I like. In the questions in the chat that we don't get to uh, during today's conversation, if um, the organizers can save and capture that and send it to me as an email, I do a velocity exercise, I call it, and answer all the questions by email uh, in brief and then send it back. And then if you wanna, if you have the capacity to send that out to everybody that's listened, anybody that doesn't get their question answered or is interested in a, a, a typed out a short version of it, which often is more coherent than me talking. That's um, fantastic and we will yeah. do it. Yeah. Okay, great, uh, yeah. great. And so, um, well, uh, in terms of speculative fiction, one thing that's happened is I'm off the cutting edge because I don't have time to read anything but my friend's work. Uh, and so I don't know what's going on, uh, but I have one friend who's working very cogently on these issues, Cory Doctorow, um, who's probably a generation younger than me. And Cory Doctorow is teaching me a lot about the, um, uh, the capacities and, and interesting stories of the future. There are many others, but there aren't enough. So, but let's go. I mean, I think the crucial question there was the last one that you articulated having to do with the problem of violence. And I, I, I have indeed been very, very uncomfortable with this all along. You write a novel in a future in which um, you can call it a best case scenario, utopian science fiction. And then there's a black wing that's doing violent and even murderous things perhaps to forward that cause, you're in bad territory morally. Um, and you can, it can look like you're advocating that or saying this is the only way it could be done. Many people have taken the book that way. And I, as a, uh, an ordinary middle-class American uh, uh, with kind of pacifist opinions, I don't wanna be suggesting that other people in the world should be doing stuff that I wouldn't do myself. There's a book by Andreas Malm called How to Blow Up a Pipeline that is very good on this issue and better than my book ministry. My, my book ministry, I will say this in its defense, it mimics the chaos and confusion of history itself, but it's not a great philosophical tool in unpacking this stuff. It's more like another case study to be pondered. Malm's book is a way to help you to ponder it by suggesting that um, well-off citizens in the developed world may have a moral responsibility to resist in civil disobedience style uh, to make sure that their representatives do a, a, a faster job of doing what the scientists told them to do. And Malm makes the point in his book that it had, the great uh, civil disobedience successes of the past uh, against slavery, uh, the civil rights movement, the, the freeing of India, these are um, um, oft, quoted exercises in civil disobedience and peaceful uh, resistance working. In all of these cases, there was a radical violent wing and the powers that be uh, were swayed by what the civil disobedience resistors were doing and, and um, were persuaded to change their ways in part from fear that if they didn't, they would end up having to deal with a much more radicalized and dangerous opponent. So Malm seems to be arguing that a violent wing, uh, for people who um, are claiming that, um, that people who are uh, resisting by, by 
doing mass actions in support of environmentalism, that there's a ban on doing anything violent, that this may be a misreading of history of how things get done. So I recommend to you Malm's book, How to Blow Up a Pipeline. It's not a technical manual about how to blow up a pipeline. It's a, it's a meditation on how middle-class uh, people in the developed world should think about these issues of resistance. In my book, it's much messier. Um, and I did this on purpose partly to um, make people take a, uh, another thought about it in ways that make it clear that actually a, a secret international organization, or let's say a black wing of an international organization like the Ministry for the Future doing um, illegal things is way too much like the CIA. It's way too likely to get out of control. It's way too likely to do things that are a, get a, create the opposite of the effect that they wanted. So uh, my character Badim is a kind of an important minor character as he's the one that is running the Black Wing and has his own, he's um, Nepalese and uh, Nepalese Indian. And he has his own views as to what effective action will do that partly, you know, in Nepal, they had a Maoist revolution. Um, 13,000 people died of violence in that Maoist revolution over a period of about 10 years and the revolution succeeded and you have a different Nepalese government. Um, is that a big success or is that a failure? Um, it's, it's not clear, but that's an awful lot of people, but maybe more people would have died if the resistance hadn't succeeded, et cetera. So um, when you regard history, it's very hard to make the cut as to what was effective and what wasn't. I recommend also to you a book by Erica Chenoweth called Why Civil Resistance Works. And this is a sociological study showing that it's the nonviolent resistance movements that have had actual success at changing governments. And the violent ones have usually just been expressions of rage that have rebounded and boomeranged against the very cause they thought they were supporting. So this, this, of course, this study too is ideological and making a case, but it's a, it's a very thought provoking and I would say encouraging case that civil resistance does work, that there's something bigger than a demonstration in the town square. There's um, not going to work. Uh, the general strike of 1926 in England, um, strikes and civil resistance of all kind can be uh, transformative and are on the table for discussion because we, um, I guess the, what, the way I wanna end this is every country has political representatives are those representatives representing you adequately or are they, have they been bought and are they representing fossil fuel capital? And no person on earth can answer that question with a, with a unqualified, oh yes, my political representative represents me perfectly. These representatives are heavily compromised. So there could be a general will to do uh, important things now that is being balked at the legislative, at the at the level of the representatives by money um, keeping them from doing their real work. There, the pressure from below of the ordinary citizens getting out into the streets and doing mass actions of a nonviolent kind to, to tell their representatives, you have to do this. We elected you to do this. And then of course, electoral successes. You have to elect people that will actually do what you want them to. And that's, those people are hard to find, but not impossible to find. So there you, and I guess what I, so this was sort of embedded in the question, so I'll finish with this. Can the imagination of how bad it would be if we got into a world of universal violence over this issue, can that drive us to make the solution faster and try to get to a nonviolent solution? Because this is really what Malm was saying. The uh, people in power were scared of the violent alternative. And so they chose the peaceful alternative and they made an accommodation and they, and they did the good things. Maybe that's a, a general response for all of us now. Beautiful, beautiful comment. Uh, Michael Northrup, our colleague from Rockefeller Brothers Fund who is deeply involved with climate work um, says, Stan, you seem to have deeply explored permaculture. Your catalog of global permaculture efforts late in the book was a remarkable service by itself. I'm wondering if you'd offer any additional thoughts and comments about permaculture as a potential scalable part of the solution. Sure, and thank you for that. Land use, um, regenerative agriculture, forestry, land use as carbon drawdown of immense power because 
we can talk about direct air capture machinery to draw down CO2. But in fact, the biology of the planet can draw down CO2 also if we manipulate it right. And since we need food and we need wood, um, the idea that we could actually draw down a, a, a fair bit of the CO2 that we've burned into the atmosphere by way of how we treat our land underlies the whole permaculture project. And they've been on this for a half a century or more. Uh, and, and, but the question of scale is really a good one because they've all, permaculture has always been really small scale. And it gets derided by the professors at UC Davis who are the designers of industrial agriculture precisely because it looks like it's hard to scale. But it's partly hard to scale because it doesn't make a profit. It just puts lots of people to work. So again, the wrong, the wrong rubric has been applied um, to like, okay, we need to grow food. Um, can we grow it organically in a way that uh, draws down carbon and that puts a whole lot of people to work? Yes, we could. But the rubric being used to uh, um, define the problem and to rate the results doesn't even include um, uh, extra employment or carbon drawdown as part of the project. It just includes extraction and uh, short-term benefits of the profit of, of uh, growing foods. And since we need food, it's, it's hard to criticize it, but it could be done so much better. And, um, and scaling it would be a matter of a, a new rubric that said, look, this is so much better that everybody ought to do it. I have an interesting, uh, um, uh, a good friend of mine works with the uh, corn farmers of, of the Midwest who are creating ethanol. So these corn farmers, um, they grow a particular kind of corn that doesn't make human food and they're trying to uh, sell it for the creation of ethanol, which being a liquid fuel, we need it and also being drawn out of the atmosphere in the first place with plants, it can be argued that ethanol is a great bridge technology that will get us to a cleaner world faster. So uh, what's interesting now is that the a really vast, uh, they're small in number because these farms are so big, but they're big in terms of land, uh, uh, the entire state of Iowa, the entire Midwest, drowning in pesticides, drowning in problems, monoculture problems, et cetera. When they do regenerative agriculture practices, it's at scale already. So this is a, 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 an interesting uh, opportunity, a pressure point. If, if um, what, what has been called industrial agriculture was greened as, as such, well, and, and with the idea that you might need more people uh, out there in the world doing it um, and not relying as much on fossil fuels to get it done using different rubrics, you might quickly change the nature of, of industrial agriculture. And so there's a big opportunity right there. Hmm. So many good questions, and I'm glad you will be responding to all of them. Uh, but uh, a specific one, uh, before we started, you're going to the Council of Parties meeting in Glasgow and going to Edinburgh for a, a TED countdown before that, a few weeks before. Uh, what is your sense? First of all, what will you be doing there? And secondly, what is your sense of how uh, Glasgow will go and what uh, we can hope for out of it? Yeah, well, it's a little mysterious to me, but I can tell basically I will be standing in for the ministry for the future, the idea of it. I will be the science fiction writer on hand um, and talking and trying to organize talks about how do we conceptualize the future? How do we tell that story in ways that are helpful to us now? Um, it's, it's a, um, uh, an interesting and a big job, it, intimidating in some ways, but, um, I've realized that there's something that I can contribute that has to do with imagining the future. And I, I take heart from various exemplary figures from science fiction's past. I'm thinking specifically of H.G. Wells, who helped his society contemplate their future in ways that got us the post-war settlement at Bretton Woods is basically an H.G. Wells uh, um, con set of concepts. And of course, H.G. Wells is just like me, a reporter from the social movements of his time. And that was helpful at Bretton Woods. So I'm gonna go over there and do that as kind of an artist uh, in residence and um, do my best. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm excited 
to try. In a way, it's just part of the circus that's there. It's part of the entertainment. They need artists that are talking about climate change. Well, there aren't that many of us, and so there I'll be. Uh, what Glasgow can do ultimately, well, I recommend to you, um, I think Tom, I saw Tom Athanasiu is on this uh, discussion and he's an um, yeah. acquaintance of mine who's educated me a lot. Um, he has an essay in the Sierra Club magazine, the online magazine that you can find, uh, I think quite quickly. And he's done a great job uh, of educating me in all kinds of matters, especially climate equity. But, in, but he's in this essay educated all of us in uh, what can we look for from the outcomes of Glasgow to see whether we got a good Glasgow or a, or a, or a failure. Mm -hmm. uh, that helped me and I'll be going over there with that, with that um, lens in my, like a monocle in my eye to look at what happens there. And to well summarize and give my own impressions of it, people are scared in a way that they weren't the, the time when the last COP meeting happened. So um, it's been delayed by a year. We've had the pandemic. We've had the latest IPCC report. The sense of urgency is higher than it's ever been. Now, can that translate into, as Tom puts it, there's a ratcheting device in the Paris Agreement itself where continuous improvement of people's pledges and of their actions in the world is promised in the agreement itself. Will we see a big ratcheting here in Glasgow or not? This is the interest of this you know, November is we don't know right now. There were confounding factors. There's the pandemic messing it up. It isn't clear. Um, there's certain petro states that are gonna come in hoping to drag their feet and mess things up, et cetera. So it, the stakes are high, but everybody is aware that the stakes are high. And this is maybe a little bit new. So we might get a, a newish seeming result. We'll find out, you know, by the by mid or late November, we'll. Well, the, the tale will have been told and it's an interesting moment in history. I would say it's an important moment in world history. Those rarely come. Uh, and yet we're, we're at one now. You quoted a knowledgeable person as saying that the Council of Parties meeting will be uh, part negotiation, part trade show and part circus and that you would be part of the circus. That was your yeah. summary. I yeah. think that's right. Um, yeah. Um, it, as pe people have told me this, I've never been to a COP meeting, but 40,000 people are going to descend on Glasgow and they're also going to be under a, a pandemic protocol. So it's going to be right. as weird as can be. Yeah. Um, uh, I want to come back to the poly crisis question for a moment. Um, your novel took on, Ministry for the Future, took on climate change as, as, as the you know, huge issue. And, and now, of course, we have the, the pandemic, which, um, which plays in interesting ways in relationship to the climate uh, uh, crisis. I mean, in some ways, it's making the climate crisis better, uh, in other ways, worse. But if, if one takes the poly crisis with the definition we use, which is just you know, one of hundreds, which is that set of several dozen environmental, social, technological, and financial economic stressors, uh, which are interacting with increasing velocity, uh, creating future shocks of greater and greater intensity and frequency, um, and uh, that it's a wicked problem in the technical sense of the term that we can't figure out how to solve it. Uh, but we do need to learn how to navigate it and we can uh, bend it uh, like bending the arc of history toward justice. We can try to bend it toward better outcomes. So my question, I have two questions <laughs> unrelated. The, the first one is, can you imagine writing a speculative fiction novel about the poly crisis, not just about climate, uh, can you imagine that technically, given how complicated that is? And then the second question, which is unrelated, is, um, is it possible that life will, um, will uh, recapitulate or copy art and that a ministry for the future might actually emerge from uh, the COP crisis? Yeah, COP well, um, good questions. Uh, the so the poly crisis, if you were to give yourself the task of writing about it, 
um, where's your characters? Where's your, do you end up just writing about an ordinary citizen doing their ordinary life? And then that illustrates the poly crisis by what happens there. The Ministry for the Future is already about the poly crisis in that land use and all the solutions possible get thrown into the bucket. And indeed, there's a big meeting in Zurich uh, at near the end of the novel that, uh, that uh, tots up all of the successes and all of the remaining problems that both the world and my novel have not managed to solve. Because like you say, it's, it's not like this is solvable. It's an ongoing problem that can be dealt with better or worse. And there are issues like uh, nuclear security, the amount of nuclear bombs lying around on the planet and, and other issues that are gonna be outstanding even if we solve the climate crisis. So I guess I'm saying no, um, ministry is as close to the poly crisis novel as I can imagine. Um, and indeed, I think you could take it as uh, one, uh, you would wanna write short novels, that's what I would like to do in future, quite short novels, having done a bunch of long ones, that take on different stories within the larger umbrella and not try to take it on all at once. So ministry represents for me a culmination, an end point, I'm, I'm done, I'm on to a new phase, etc. for me personally. And as for others, I never like to say what other artists should do. They can, they'll figure it out themselves and we'll see what they try. But I think in theory, it's a, it's a, it's a, it would blow up. Even the novel, as capacious as it is, would be somewhat uh, blown up by trying to take on the totality. The totality is unrepresentable, you might say, and needs to be taken on piece by piece. Now, let's see, I, what, the second question, it was in my head just a second ago. Uh, the second question is, could life imitate art? Oh. And, uh, could, could a ministry for the future in Zurich, somebody describe your novel as a love letter to Zurich, which I love. Uh, I mean, it is a love letter to Zurich and, and Zurich deserves a love letter. Uh, but uh, can you, uh, I mean, people have tried to identify exactly the house where the ministry was. You can find all those things online. But uh, can we imagine that the council of parties might create a ministry for the future? Right on your novel. Yeah. Well, um, first Zurich and then a real ministry. Yes, I love Zurich. Uh, my wife and I spent two years there when we were young. I've never found a good reason, a good um, venue to write about it. And this was the great opportunity to write about it. And of course, with 35 years of nostalgia piled onto it, it's an extremely affectionate portrait. And it has been well received in Zurich, which is no surprise to me. We've even made contact with old friends and made a bunch of new friends since the book came out. And it will be in its German edition. It might be already, but it's very soon gonna be published in German. Mm -hmm. So yay, Zurich, a beautiful town. And indeed, you could definitely find Mary Murphy's apartment and her offices because I named the street. Uh, right. Hochstrasse is, is a, a real street and you can walk down that street and see all the buildings involved with, uh, with my novel. Now, whether a real one could be, um, well, there's, a, yes, there's a ministry for the future for the country of Wales. And I did a podcast with Jane Davidson, the, the um, politician who managed to get that set up. Um, it, it, it speaks to this whole question of legal representation and legal standing for things that aren't there yet. Future people, animals, people who can't speak in the courts for themselves children, also the Children's Trust. So we have precursors and we have analogs to the Ministry for the Future. Um, but I'll say this, and once you get a big bureaucracy that's set up into different departments, like any government or like the world international system, a Ministry for the Future steps on too many toes. It invades the turf of every other department and says, no, you have to take this, this, the future into account in your own calculations right now. So it's more a meta agency it, it, and it's um, heavily resented and disliked. Like you can't have a department, you can't have a, uh, a secretary of science for uh, in, the, in the US federal government in the administration. Why? Because the secretary of science would be stepping on the toes of every other department being a kind of meta thing. So you have a science advisor who is um, put off to the side and doesn't have the same powers. A ministry for the future would be in that, in, in that same position. It, it uh, uh, claims too much power from already existing power and therefore will be resisted and opposed. 
On the other hand, we see that it might be needed and maybe it would exist as a meta agency, as a everybody has to put the future into their um, rubric of what is doable and good to do now into their cost benefit analyses. In, and, and it just change the discount rate, change the discount rate used to calculate future value, change it to zero first and see if that doesn't um, um, alter your conclusions about what is best to do right now. Um, th that might be the ministry for the future in a kind of a abstracted way that is applied across the board. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if an actual ministry for the future is not really going to happen, but is more of a concept, a working idea that gets injected into every other part of the way that we govern ourselves. Beautiful. There, there was an interesting, there's so many interesting conversations. I thank everyone. I'm so glad you will respond to them all. But one interesting conversation that was going on is about the, the scalability of renewables. And so, I mean, can, can renewable energy scale uh, to the level required, uh, even in a, a utopian ideal world, as you described it, uh, to, meet, to meet basic needs? <laughs> Well, I think yes, Let, but let's talk about this verb scale or this noun. A scale is a word out of the current moment of neoliberal capitalism. Right. So it means, um, um, well, if you split it into two parts, can we physically do it to create renewable energy in a, in a fast manner, which would be the, the work involved with creating the, the uh, mining the materials assembling the materials and putting them online? Um, the answer to that is probably yes. Can we pay for it? Uh, which is another question. Is it, if I only invest in the highest rate of return, would I put my money here? And that's, a, that's what people mean when they say, will it scale? Is, is it profitable now for me and my business or for the world at large? So there, the two parts of scale, very often the physical and the economic are jammed together in these words. Um, innovation, um, you know, can, it means not only making something up that's new, but can I profit from this? Um, an entrepreneur, can I start a business, but will that business be profitable? The language of, um, of our moment of capitalism is um, obscures the certain realities of combinations of the physical and the economic in ways that need to be unpacked and say, well, what are we really talking about here? Um, can it scale in the economic sense? No, but that's where you need the carbon coin, you need um, carbon quantitative easing, you need the governments to um, say, this is as important as the Pentagon budget. We will therefore dedicate money from the public funds that we've made up ourselves that everybody trusts the US dollar is anchor. Uh, and we're going to dedicate this money to these purposes. At that point, it has scaled uh, because it's been taken on by the biggest company of all the US government. So um, here again, you come back to the Keynesian solution of you need both public and private, but the public needs to lead It needs to be um, directed at the level of central banks and legislation saying, we're paying for this stuff. We've got the tech, now we've got the money. And so you get the, the Climate Conservation Corps, but also you get private industries all across the board. The way Boeing benefited from the um, aerospace programs and from the space program, the private companies would be getting paid to do this necessary work. And one can argue that national defense is always necessary too, but obviously that's been hypertrophied into a armaments industry that is self-sustaining and doesn't have anything to do with human safety. That's a, that's a huge fund of, of cash and money uh, that uh, in terms of scaling, both get the military involved in it and also take money from the military and pay it for uh, clean energy. And yes, it can scale. Mm. Uh, do you think this is a sidelight for this conversation in many ways, but do you think about the toxic footprint of renewable energy? I mean, you look at some of the calculations that have been done on electric cars and the toxic footprint in terms of, you know, uh, you know, special metals and so on and so forth. 
uh, I have you thought when you when you respond to the question about can renewable energy scale uh, at what cost in terms of uh, toxicity? Yeah. Yes. Uh, my my wife is a um, environmental chemist. Right. Who, work, who works on the fate of pesticides in the environment after they're used to kill pests. Mm -hmm. So, and indeed the earth is incapable of uh, processing yeah. the load of poisons that's being dumped on it. So I'm, I'm aware of this problem. And I guess I would say that it, at this point, we're in a, a, a game of uh, triage of uh, which is worse. And here, here again, a, a good cost benefit analysis that uses the right rubrics would be very important. Um, we do need to draw CO2 out of the atmosphere. We do need to stop burning it into the atmosphere as fast as possible. So mm -hmm. all the uh, technologies we're putting into play right now need to be regarded as bridge technologies. Mm. So um, like ethanol, for instance, it's got its downsides in terms of land use, but if it were greened, then it's a liquid fuel, but it's a bridge technology to getting better. It could be that nuclear power using thorium rather than uranium is a bridge technology that we need a couple more generations of to get to stuff that's even cleaner. And even the cleanest things that we can imagine right now might not be as clean as tide power or wave power. Um, it could be that the toxic footprints that we're creating right now can be made better by an ongoing process of improvement. Um, it is an issue. And what, what I'd like to point out is the material science community has been fantastic. The work being done in the sciences on our ability to manipulate the natural world to our own good uh, means that we might have, you know, anything from uh, uh, using cheap and uh, less toxic materials to do the things that we need to do that right now we're using quite toxic materials to do all the way up to fusion power. All across the board, um, cleaner technologies are being developed fast. And then the question again goes back, well, could they scale? And you go back to what I said before, technologically, can they scale is one question. Will we pay for it to do it fast is the other part of scaling. And presumably we will. I'm, I'm gonna just, uh, as we enter the closing minutes, just so, so rich here, read a number of them. Again, I share Miller from Post Carbon Institute and Resilience.org, which for those of you who don't know it, for me is one of the extraordinary organizations working in this space. He says, I'm going to respectfully disagree with Stan if we're talking about true substitution, we're talking about energy, without transforming all sectors, including industrial agriculture, and certainly not at the speed necessary uh, without uh, appropriating resources from the rest of the economy, especially if you want to avoid a near-term carbon pulse. And then um, he went on to say, which gets me to the larger question, how do we work within current systems while replacing them, specifically capital markets? And then Richard Sharsky uh, wrote, respectfully, the carbon's currency is at the heart of the ministry theory of action. Uh, uh, from a technical point of view, and um, and uh, all the technology and resource allocation issues turn on whether there is an adequate scaled finance to incentivize decarbonization at needed uh, speed and scale. Linnea Lombard wrote, I want to reiterate Benjamin's question about the role of philanthropy in addressing the poly crisis, especially in relationship to climate change. Um, and so on. So, um, so we're generating a very rich conversation. Let me just put it that way. And um, and and we we could not be more grateful to you um, for uh, joining with us. Uh, we really do believe, otherwise we wouldn't be making the effort that if we can bring uh, poly crisis funding to scale the way we already did 22 years ago with Health and Environmental Funders Network, if we could be moving $200 million a year into polycrisis research and uh, policy and uh, engaged action, uh, it, it could have a very powerful impact on the, on the independent sector. And so you really have written what is for many of us the most exciting engaging 
text on the poly crisis. And I take your point that it's about much more than just about climate. It really is about the poly crisis. So I'll go to this question for you. Have you thought about or have you been approached? Because not everybody's going to read this very long book, turning this into uh, a, a, you know, a, a Netflix series or a film. I think it could be immensely powerful if it, if it reached uh, through art uh, the wide visual audience. Yeah. Well, I can just briefly say the book has been optioned by, um, you know, a major Hollywood studio with the idea of making it into a TV show uh, online, I presume, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Um, the, the venue hasn't been chosen. The production studio is working on it. I wouldn't hold my breath on that. I've had many of my books optioned and I believe they are, they are wicked problems for a screenplay writer. Mm -hmm. um, you can't figure out how to um, uh, organize them. And most screenplay writers don't trust my judgment. And so they try to reinvent mm -hmm. things that I've already figured out solutions to and the whole thing falls apart. We'll see if that happens. But to go back to your other questions, I think that the, um, it's very true that uh, private philanthropy and the, and the projects you have going in immensely helpful as kind of priming the pump or hitting the the places that can have immediate results in the world and sh and be demonstration projects. The, and this goes back to the very first comment that you read, which I would basically agree with. Um, I, I don't think we're in disagreement there. It's a totality problem where I think the, the big experiment going forward is going to be how many trillions of dollars of new money can we generate per year to pay for human work to do rapid decarbonization <clears throat> and all other good efforts without um, wrecking people's faith in money itself, without creating inflation or deflation? Could it be that you could generate up to $5 trillion to $10 trillion a year that is injected into the economy in somewhat in the way that modern monetary theory suggests, but it's also just Keynes um, that be created by governments. And we're gonna be in an ongoing experiment. It, and this is, if we're doing things right, we'll be in an ongoing experiment to see how much new money we can create and spend on um, <clears throat> decarbonization. And because economics is not a good predictive science, it's not even a, it's barely even a, a science at all, but uh, quantification is important, economics is, is a, a necessary, and a, a better economics would be one goal to shoot at immediately out of your philanthropical efforts. I, I refer you to Stanford, which the, the um, CASBIS at Stanford is working on a, a new moral political economy. Well, I, that's a, a very small and I think flawed project because it, um, it, by introducing moral, it, 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 it creates historical and ethical problems immediately. We need a new political economy um, that is a kind of a post-capitalism that nevertheless could be instituted within the capitalism that we exist in right now. That's why I revert to Keynes and quantitative easing. So we're going to be in that experiment big time. How much, um, if we can develop the political will to have our representatives undertake that experiment. So again, it's a kind of we the people thing of forcing our representatives to, to take these bold and persistent experiments as FDR called them. We're, we're caught in that the necessity of that now. Mm. Uh, you spoke of uh, moving to a new chapter in your own life. Could you say more about what you see that being? Yes. Um, uh, I don't think it's very important. It's just personal. I, I am done with the main line of long novels. So let's just keep it at the artistic level. On the personal level, my wife's retiring. I'm going to not sign contracts where I'm committed to writing a novel every 16 months, which is what I did for about 10 years. And I quite enjoyed it. That's over now. I'm going to write novellas and I'm going to keep trying to find good stories to tell within say 120 pages rather than these 600 page blockbusters. Mm -hmm. So I'm also finishing a nonfiction book about backpacking in the Sierra Nevada which necessarily turned into yet another book about climate change because the Sierra Nevada and all mountain areas are going to be hammered one way or another, just like the rest of the earth. And it's a question, what is wilderness for? So then again, land use and taking care of the other animals. 
uh, although I considered it just to be a suburban house husband's hobby with no particular virtue to it, uh, backpacking in wilderness runs you across a certain number of wild animals. And that's very thought provoking. That's a spiritual uh, um, event, mm -hmm. uh, mystical and powerful to, to watch wild animals living their lives independently of us in wilderness mm -hmm. is something everybody should experience and very few people do. And when, it, when you do have that experience on a pretty regular basis, uh, for me, the, my backpacking book has become yet another uh, climate change statement in a nonfiction memoir type form. So that's it for me. I'll, I'll slow down. I'll presumably be um, standing in for the minister for the future for a long time, uh, which is crazy, but I can do it. Um, and we'll go on from there. This is a strange question, but I like to ask it. Um, I understand a lot about your, you know, the, the, the life that you've made visible and that has been such an immense contribution. And by the way, we, we believe that speculative fiction and, and science fiction are core uh, to our project of uh, the Omega Resilience Funders and the broader Omega network of NGOs and and funders and others. Um, but another dimension that's core is the religious, spiritual, philosophical systems that we use to orient ourselves and to, you know, as Nietzsche said, those who have a why to live can bear most any how. Um, since you have immersed yourself in, in all the tragic depth of what we are facing and the unlikelihood that we will actually do what the Ministry for the Future describes. Do you have, beyond your commitment to science, to nature, to uh, leftist uh, you know, progressive vision for the world, is there an inner core for you, religious, spiritual, philosophical, that, that orients you and keeps you able to uh, move forward in your life? Uh, yes. I would say that I am a kind of um, um, a California hippie Buddhist, uh, mm -hmm. Zen in the Zen tradition of um, uh, chop wood, carry water. That mm -hmm. that ordinary daily life can be turned into a devotional action, is a way of making meaning out of repetition and the pseudo iterative and things that I'm interested in as a novelist, um, and I, I I pursue that as a way to transform my daily life. And then, as I said, the, the, my frequent trips up into wilderness is a kind of a devotional action also, um, a matter of worship and a feeling of the sacred or the miraculous, um, that, that this universe is some kind of a miracle is, is very evident to me when I'm in wilderness. And I try to carry that back with me down to civilized life. Uh, and so I, I owe a lot of this to Gary Snyder and to the California hippie Zen Buddhist tradition that he um, helped to create in the first place. And so um, Gary would scoff at the idea of being a guru figure. But in fact, there's a whole number of Californians and the artist Tom Killian. Um, and it goes on and on where uh, Gary has been an exemplary figure to uh, give you a, a kind of a sense of the sacred in daily practice. Uh, I'm, I'm proud. Uh, I, he's a friend. Um, I cherish him and I've learned a lot from him and that and but he would immediately want to add. He's just one representative of a whole tradition of if you're in California, do, do you look to Asia instead of Europe? for your inspiration, particularly since you are part of Asian culture with California as one of the most multicultural places on earth, as you know, uh, with 120 languages and a, and a really um, substantial population of people from all over. And California works pretty well. So um, this is, I mean, religion, that's from religio, uh, what binds us together, the Latin, what binds us. And so on that social level of what binds us, the social level of religion, uh, um, California serves as a kind of a, <clears throat> a practical religion. So I'm, I'm not a particularly uh, spiritual or religious person to tell you the truth. But when you ask that question, I realize I do have some underlying 
it's a kind of existentialism really. So Nietzsche comes into that as well. I will close with uh, quoting Gary Snyder from his a poem for the children. Oh yeah. The rising hills, the slopes of statistics lie before us. The steep climb of everything going up, up as we all go down. In the next century or the one beyond that, they say our valleys, pastures, we can meet there in peace if we make it. To climb these coming crests, one word to you and your children. Stay together, learn the flowers, go light. Mm. Beautiful. Kim Stanley Robinson, we cannot thank you enough for spending this time with us. Um, our thoughts and prayers go with you. Um, you've created um, a text that will be with us for a very long time. We wish you luck at the council and parties. Um, we are eternally grateful that you will stand for the ministry for the future in this next chapter of your life. Um, so thank you so much. And uh, any last word from you? Yeah, thank you, Michael. And thank you, Gary Snyder. Thank you, Stanley, and everybody that's uh, come on for this conversation. Um, I appreciate your time and, and uh, your interest. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a novelist. And it's, it's very gratifying to think that the novel still can um, entertain and instruct people in the way that Aristotle um, called for. Uh, it's reassuring and um, I love it dearly. And so I'm very grateful. So thank you all. So we'll end by turning it back over to Stanley. Stanley, woo. Thanks so much, Michael. And thanks so much, Stanley. Um, there is clearly a lot to reflect on here. And thank you all for joining us. Um, we really appreciate you all being here. And a recording of this webinar will be made available on Omega NGO, the New School at Commonweal, and the Resilience Project websites. If you're interested in receiving more invitations like this, you can register on our website. And we very much look forward to seeing you next time on our webinar. And we will share more information and follow up with these questions with you all shortly. Thank you so much.